This is Ask Lisa, a podcast to help people understand the psychology of parenting now in the midst of a pandemic. Psychologist Dr. Lisa Damore, author of two New York Times bestselling parenting books, takes your questions. And I'm co-host Rena Ninen, a journalist and mom of two. Some of what we talk about comes from raising children ourselves. Most of the time, I'll be getting answers to your parenting questions. So send your questions to AskLisa at DrLisaDemore.com. Episode 25, How Do I Get My Smelly Teenager to Take a Shower? So, Rena. Yes? I happen to know that you are very excited about the coming weekend, maybe losing your mind. Uh, You're a huge football fan. You've been reading my Twitter feed. I have. And you're from Tampa Bay. I'm so proud of my Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Can I just tell you, as a girl who grew up in Tampa, almost two decades since we've been here. And uh, it's just so awesome. I'm so excited for my hometown. Well, and you love football. I, I do love football. It's it's because of my son, who's 10. He got into it, so I've gotten into it. And, you know, I had a chance to actually interview Rob Gronkowski uh, about 18 months ago or so and spend time with his family. And so it was nice to get a, a real inside view of American football. And is Rob Gronkowski as larger than life in person as he seems? Can I just tell you, he is larger yeah. than you can imagine in life, but he is also kinder. Like uh-huh. genuinely kind, and his whole family is like that. I met his spent a lot of time his mom and his dad and his brothers and his girlfriend Camille, and God, they are just a great family. And doesn't he have like three brothers and they're all giants? Four, four, four total, brothers. five boys. Yeah. Oh my goodness, Mama Gronk. I keep saying, Mama Gronk, you got to <laughs> write a book. She's got to write a book. <laughs> I think uh, Mama Gronk actually would have some insight on the question that we're going to take on today. <laughs> I almost thought we should have Diane phone in because she would definitely have something to say about this. So we we got this letter. I'm going to read it to you. I'm a single mother of two teenagers in Connecticut, a girl who's 16 and a boy who's 13. For the most part, they've been coping well with all the abrupt changes that the pandemic has brought to their lives. However, I've been struggling to get my 13-year-old boy to keep up with his personal hygiene. He sometimes goes four to five days in a row without showering. He stinks and his bedroom stinks. When his school was fully remote or hybrid, his excuse was that he was home most of the time and didn't need a shower as much. But he's now in school five days a week. He doesn't care that he shows up with oily hair and stinky armpits. I've bought him several books on boy growth, which includes chapters on the importance of staying clean. And we've discussed them with him at no avail. Please help me, Lisa. How do I get my son to shower more often? My daughter and I will be forever grateful. (laughs) <laughs> I love this letter. It's a great letter. And I know this is not unusual. What do you um, think is happening here? So it's interesting. Sometimes as a psychologist, I'm like, oh, this is a really complex dynamic. And we want to go deep and uncover the, the, the rich, you know, kind of unconscious aspects. Okay, this is not one of those. Um, <laughs> the deal on something like this is... It's not unusual for younger teenagers and maybe 13-year-old boys whose puberty has kind of snuck up on them. They just don't really get it. They just, they're kind of out to lunch sometimes about what's happening with their bodies and the way their bodies are changing and the, you know, kind of ramifications of that. And so I actually think the most useful way to approach this is to not make more of it than is necessary. I mean, just to really treat it like he kind of doesn't get it. And then to try to help him get it. But that's, I think, the most um, commonsensical approach and also most likely to be useful approach. But how do you make him get it when it's like he can't smell himself? Well, see, this is the thing. They can't smell themselves. And they need to be helped to understand that. And one of the... um, one of the areas this gets us into in, in academic psychology is sensory and perception. And one of the things that we study in that area of psychology is something called habituation. And this again, and we do this all the time in academic psychology, we come up with fancy terms and a whole lot of research for things that everybody's like, uh, yeah, we know. So, so habituation is where you get used to a sensory input and no longer notice it. And we do this all the time as humans because otherwise we would be flooded with sensory information. And so an experiment, and, you know, every parent knows their kiddos best and what's going to fly and not fly. 
But if this mother felt that she needed to explain habituation to her son, and basically what we say we call olfactory habituation, like getting used to smells, happens really fast. But if she needed to explain it, she could say to him, okay, buddy, come here, hold out your hand. I'm putting a coin in your hand. And then say to him, you see how you feel it? Now let's hang out here for another five, ten seconds. See how you no longer feel it? Ooh. That's habituation. You're designed to not continue to notice sensory input because otherwise you would feel your clothes all day and you'd hear the hum of your computer all day. And then say, you know, either with or without this experiment, smell habituates really quickly. Mm. And and you know how, (laughs) Rena, have you ever had this happen where you leave and you go away on vacation? Well, like, okay, now we're talking a long time ago. And then you come back to your house and you notice the smell of your own home. Yes. But yes. only after being gone for like days at a yeah. time. It always smells that way. We just don't notice. So I think part of how you keep this neutral, which is where we want this, is to be like, buddy, we're not saying you're trying to make things hard. We're saying you can't smell the situation. We can smell the situation. Yeah. And... So there's a problem here, whether or not you're aware of it. So I think this is so much harder as we're in quarantine because personal hygiene, I can see how this kid's like, look, I'm not seeing anybody. I don't need to do this. (laughs) And I find it goes head to head trying to get them to take a shower. At the end of the day, I'm exhausted. They're exhausted. I just don't know when to have this conversation. Exactly. Right. And you can just see what a setup this is. Right. You're exhausted. They're exhausted. Your kid smells bad. They still have homework to do. I mean, the kid's 13. He's probably eighth grade. He's probably got some work to do. And here comes another night where you really need the kid to shower and he's not in the mood to shower or he wants to relax finally after a long day. Um, So I think some of how to approach this, and this is a great generic lesson for all of parenting, is when do you want to have this conversation? And you probably don't want to have it at, you know, 930 at night right? when the stakes feel really high and everybody's at their worst. So part of how a parent would want to approach this, and, you know, especially if they're going to do corny things like, give me your hand, I'm going to, you know, put a coin in it, is to do it at a time when, you know, people are in a good mood, the day mm-hmm. is relatively fresh, you know, to not mm-hmm. roll up on a kid at the worst possible moment, which is basically when this is almost always likely to go down. Yeah. So when when should you have that like when when do you find is best, right? You always say you gotta have a cooling off period, and yeah. so when you're head to head and you you start to talk about it at the end of the night, like when is the appropriate time to talk? I think maybe on the weekend, maybe you even make an appointment to talk. Which again, I know sometimes can sound really corny, but mm-hmm. I think a lot about how. As a parent, you're thinking and thinking and thinking about something, and then you want to talk about it with your kid, and they're hearing about it for the first time. And so it might actually be a pretty good idea to say to this boy, "Um, buddy, we got to have a – we got to figure out the showering thing because what we're doing isn't working. And actually, that's one of my favorite phrases clinically. What we're doing Mm. isn't working. Like you just kind of call it (laughs) that. And then say, let's talk tomorrow. Let's find a time just to sit like for three minutes, even guaranteeing them that it's not going to be some long, you know, tedious conversation. Say, can we talk tomorrow for three minutes when you get home from school? Can we just make a plan for that? And then he can kind of orient himself to that conversation, maybe be more useful in that conversation. And again, I would say that's true for lots of things in parenting where the parent is you know, thinking and thinking or maybe stewing and stewing Mm -hmm. and then drops it on the kid. And the kid's like, wham, like what just happened? And then the parent should not be surprised that the conversation goes disastrously from that point. Wow. How do you motivate them, right? Like, I don't want to have this discussion. Okay, I'm going to have to have it at some point. You say, don't surprise them, like let them know it's coming. But I don't want to keep having this discussion. How do I get them to self-motivate and do it? I think the magic word, and this is a word I've become much more interested in since the pandemic began, and I know we've talked about this, is routines. That it cannot be a day-by-day question mark about when this kid showers. And so maybe having teed up the conversation, given the kid the warning the conversation's coming, and maybe even as part of teeing it up, say, buddy, I want to talk about this. And one of the questions I want to answer is, where in your day will showering happen? I want you to think that through. Hmm. And then walk away from it. But walk out of the actual conversation or maybe walk into the actual conversation saying, okay, look, our routines are all wonky 
from the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I get it. But here we are. You're in a rhythm of going to school five days. Showering needs to happen every day. And I would just say that in a very matter of fact, kind of this is a non-negotiable. When in your day does it work for showering to happen? And Mm -hmm. really make him think it through. And if he says, I'll do it at the end of the night, he might say, uh, really? (laughs) (laughs) Or, okay, let's try it. And if that doesn't work, we have to come up with another point in the day. But you want to move the friction off of the question of whether or not this kid is showering, the kid is showering, to the question of where in his routine does he want to make it happen? Slightly shameful, but I feel like I need to have this conversation first with myself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just no, no, actually, like, I know what you mean. It's like, I notice I get nothing done on the days I don't shower in the morning. Like, it's just, I'm not as productive. I, I'm still in the PJs. The kids are out the door to school. Like, I'm realizing I need to have this talk with myself. No, it's true. But that, I mean, in some ways, actually, Rena, what you're, what you're giving this mom is another opening, which is to say, if, it, if she's feeling what you and I are feeling, because I agree, some days I'm like, uh, when was I going to shower? Because- yeah. Since I've stayed home all day, and I think I might exercise, and so I'm putting it off. A mom could even say in this moment, or a dad could even say in this moment, buddy, like, I'm struggling to come up with new routines, but I feel a lot better when there's predictability in my day. And the basics, like showering, brushing our teeth, combing our hair, I'm not figuring those out on a day-to-day basis. I'm getting better at it. You need to get better at it. But the other thing that's really important in this, this kind of underlying what we're saying is there are lots of points in parenting where you can just lay down the law and you don't have to be embarrassed or feel like somehow that's not loving parenting where you're like, dude, okay, the reality is you need to shower every day. Like, it's okay to just say that to kids and not feel like you're being ungenerous or unempathic. So when you say that you can just lay down the law, what when I say, okay, it's lay down the law time, when do you find that works or could be used best? That tactic, right, of laying down the law? Well, it's interesting when you say best. Because what I think is often behind that question is, when is my kid going to like it and is it going to go yeah, smoothly? you're right. That's it. Okay, so if you could toss that out the window, this gets a whole lot easier. Right? Your kid may not like it. It may mm. not go smoothly. Mm. And... It's okay. Actually, it's essential to parenting that there be moments when we're like, yep, I see you're unhappy about this. This is in the category of the non-negotiables. It's what's happening. And, you know, that's it. And just to accept that your kid may be angry with you and may be upset with you. And it's a little bit of evidence that you're just doing your job. And you don't have to make it spicier than that. You don't have to be hurt that your kid is angry. I think that that's actually where this could go wrong. Mm -hmm. I think this is, you know, we were talking last week about single parents. I was so glad in this letter that the mom has a 16-year-old daughter as her ally because if she really, really makes this 13-year-old mad, at least she's got, you know, the 16-year-old daughter who's like, mom, I got your back. I got your back. We got to clean it up around here. And sometimes the older sibling can help with that in many ways, too, the fact that she's older. But I like this concept you say that there are non-negotiables. Like, what are non-negotiables? Like, obviously, hygiene, taking a shower. But what do you put in that category? Safety is a non-negotiable. And I think that's really, especially as kids move into later adolescence and especially, you know, hopefully as the pandemic eases back and we can open up. Safety is a non-negotiable, like anything involving, you know, where you could get hurt. I think parents have every right to just lay down the law. And the the thing is, kids expect parents to lay down the law about that. Um, it actually weirds kids out when grownups don't act like grownups. And so they know you're supposed to shower every day, or this boy's catching on to this. They know you're not supposed to, you know, do dangerous things. And if parents are flexible or casual about those things, kids find it very strange. But they tell me in my practice they don't tell their parent. <laughs> so oh, Interesting. Yeah. No, so one of the things that has happened multiple times in my practice, and this is with older teenagers, but it could happen with 13-year-olds, is where um, a kiddo will say to me, oh, yeah, so we were over at, you know, Jenny's house and like her mom will buy for us, you know, meaning alcohol. 
And they put it forward kind of casually. And, um, and I'll say, really? And the kid will go, I know, isn't it weird? Isn't it weird? And, the, and kind of putting that casual piece forward, they're sort of, I think, not wanting to tip my hand one way or another, you know, wanting to really see what I think. And I've learned in those moments not to be cool about it. Because then the kid thinks like, okay, well, where is a grown up? Could somebody please find me a grown up? So I think parents should feel like they are an enormously firm footing around hygiene and mm-hmm. safety and basic decency. And even if their kid bristles a little bit, they should pat themselves on the back like, good, my kid expected that, may have been doing their independent seeking job to seem a little bit, you know, put off by it. But there are things that are just, they're just things and they're just going to happen. Yeah. When you are trying to motivate them and, and, and get them to be sort of on the same page as you on something like this, what do you think, like, what else can a parent do? So I don't think we give boys enough credit for liking bath products. <laughs> what? Really? <laughs> yeah. You know how there's like this huge giant market of smelly bath products for yes. girls and women? Yeah. Um, and and I definitely, you know, for my adolescent daughter, like a lot of her Christmas list is, you know, nice Satsuma pro- this. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, and I love it because I'm a big fan of what I call consumable Christmas, you know, like stuff that we're going to use up. Consumable Christmas. I love yeah. that. Um, but boys often like, um, I'm going to keep calling them smelly bath products, um, too, (sighs) because this can take a lot of forms. So, Rena, you've got a 10-year-old son. Does he still use, like, straight-up soap, or has he expressed interest in, you know, branching out? Soap and shower gel, you know, all that stuff. But both of my kids, and and myself, I have to admit, have really gotten into the concept of taking a bath with, like, bath salts, and it kind of makes them feel like they're in a hot tub or pool or some, you know, like, so they've gotten into that. Um, but my daughter more so. But boys will take baths. Yeah. So I guess, in, you know, so one of the ways to have this conversation is, all right, the non-negotiable is you will be bathing every day. Mm-hmm. Here are some negotiables. When you do it, um, whether you shower or take a bath, right, this mom could offer that to her son. And then the other thing I think she should say is, and if you want to go to the drugstore with me, we will go when there's plenty of time and you can stand there in front of the full array of products and smell through your mask mm. as many as you want until you pick the one you like. And there's all sorts of, you know, like Old Spice has a long line of stuff and there's always yeah. a sport version for boys who see themselves as athletic. You know, I mean, that, that there that's a market. And, yeah. Yeah. and so it can be made nice. It can be made fun. It doesn't have to feel all, you know, tedious. So... I know you're a psychologist, but can you weigh on, in on what age kids should start wearing deodorants? Because it's oh. also not just a boy thing, right? Girls oh, in yeah. puberty, right? Absolutely. Odors so, change. I think as soon as <laughs> there's a sense that they have started to, you know, have smells coming yeah. from their armpits. Yeah. And and what's important, and again, one of those things that as soon as I say it, everybody, everybody will be like, oh, yeah, that's right. Girls on it's not on average, actually, the modal age of onset, the most frequent age of onset of puberty for girls is 12 and mm-hmm. boys for 14. Mm-hmm. But there's stuff happening before those ages, too. But the bottom line is your daughter's going to need this usually before your son, just because mm. puberty occurs younger in girls. But again, with deodorant, if you get the sense that it's something that um, it's time, you will smell that it's time. I would take any child to the drugstore and be like, all right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, enjoy yeah. And, and make it um, a growing up thing, a fun thing, an uh, indulgence thing, a special thing. And if you don't feel like going, you can even order online and say, here are the different types of scents. Let's try it, you know, and have it delivered to your doorstep. Exactly. Right? Exactly. There's probably some deodorant sampler out there, right, <laughs> that, uh, yeah. that we could try. Um <gasps> The thing to watch out for, the reason I kind of stuck with the word smelly, are the body sprays. <laughs> Have you heard anything from your son about body sprays? Has he no. expressed any interest in this? I, I don't think they're into that yet. No. Okay. Well, Rena, like, get ready. Because there will be a day <laughs> where he comes. Is his room upstairs where he comes downstairs? Upstairs, yeah. Yeah. And somehow he will have gotten his hands on some axe. Oh, my gosh. And sprayed himself with it. And you're going to feel like you're going to pass out. Um, 
he'll use way too much. <laughs> he'll be overwhelmed. Oh, that <laughs> is so, funny. Yeah, I mean, I think the key here is like, and especially if this 13-year-old boy in, the, in this wonderful letter, you know, tries to move in this direction, you can't cover up smells. Mm-hmm, like you can't mm-hmm. put axe on instead of shower. <laughs> um, and then the challenge with stuff like axe and like the boys typically do go through this phase where they're really into the body sprays and the way they smell because it does feel older. Remind them again about habituation because you stop smelling it. Mm-hmm. And so you put on more because you can't smell it anymore. Mm. And then you're basically walking around with like a cloud behind you. So so they need help sometimes down-regulating how much Axe body spray they use. <laughs> you know, I feel like you need to write to the National Psychological Association and tell them habituation. What is it? Habit- what do you call it? Habituation. Yeah, habituation. Habituation. Such yeah. a strange word that doesn't mean much to the outside world. Maybe that's why you guys have an inner club here. Mm-hmm. We need a new name. Like, I don't know. I don't know what. But habituation. It's actually- it's like so funny. It's, it's kind of adapting. Like you just adapt to it. You oh, just stop noticing. I mean, but we do. Like I've said this before, we have to have our own language because yeah. of, I don't know why we do that. <laughs> so I love it. And and I have to say, go Tampa Bay Buccaneers. My oh, heart man. I'm is gonna root with for you. you. I'm going to root for you. Um, Thank you. I'm a Denver girl. And so the Broncos have always been uh-huh. important. And it's actually very funny. Um, and now I live in Cleveland, who did surprisingly well this year. Yeah, for football. that's right. But actually, so Tom Brady, uh, your yep. quarterback, yeah, was an undergraduate football player at the University of Michigan when I was a graduate student. No at the way. University of Michigan. Yeah. Was and, he good back then? Well, kind of like unremarkable. <laughs> he no, was actually, I can't imagine. Yeah, him. no, he um, he was picked 199th in the draft. Yeah, everyone talks about this, right? Yeah, yeah, like the best deal of all times. This is why I love him. You know, just proof that he came from essentially nothing. And people were like, he's not going to do anything in Tampa Bay. What does he think? And boom, we made it to the Super Bowl. So I love it when people rule people out or think that they're not good enough and they prove that they are. Yeah, no, he was definitely like an unexpected gift out of University of Michigan football. Amazing, amazing. Um, I love it. So go Buccaneers and go Bucks, you know, go Bucks. It's so funny because you're talking about smelling bad, and and I'm just <laughs> thinking we're like in the dead of winter, and what is summer going to be like? And speaking of dead of winter, like February should be like, is it National Mental Health Month? Because we've got to do something. We've all got to snap out of it, right? Okay, it's not, but it should be. So National <sighs> Mental Health Month is May, and I feel like. Hmm, by May, <laughs> people tend to feel a little bit better. February is an unbelievably hard month from a mental health perspective. And the way I know this is that I am a little bit old fashioned in how I do my private practice. And I keep a handwritten ledger, ledger of my, um, my billing hours. And partly I do it just because I've always done it that way. And partly I do it because then I know it's 100% um, actually secure uh-huh. um, and confidential and not online anywhere. And especially when I was practicing a lot more with kids and teenagers, February was the only month that my ledger went onto a second page Wow! when I was doing my billing. And I noticed it every single year. And there is something about February, especially for kids and teenagers, but I think also for grownups, where um, for kids and teenagers, whatever is not working well at school is now fully realized. Like you are really in the thick of whatever has been um, brewing that's not so great at school. And the relief of getting to the end of the school year is still too far away to provide much comfort. And so um, clinicians, and this is true, all of my colleagues in child and adolescent psychology, we always know February is when we're going to get a lot of calls to our practice. Mm -hmm. And so here we are, um, start of February, and we're all thinking, man, oh, man, that's pre-pandemic. We feel it. We that's feel pre-pandemic. It. Yep. So we are launching something fabulous for the month of February. Tell us about it, Lisa. We're going to do it on our Ask Lisa podcast Instagram. Every day, there's going to be something with the hashtag 28 days of mental health to go. And every day, there will be a little simple tip about what you can be doing for yourself or your kids or with your kids to just keep your mental health higher in the incredibly hard month of February. So follow us on the Ask Lisa podcast Instagram. It will be there for you every morning, 28 days of mental health to go.
I love it. I'm looking forward to it. We need a pick me up every day. So this is so great. And also you have a fabulous book giveaway. Tell us about that one. So in keeping with puberty and smelliness, we are going to give away to one winner, three books um, from Dr. Cara Natterson, who was our guest um, not too long ago. We love her. She is the author of fantastic puberty books for kids. So she's the author of Guy Stuff, the body book for boys. And she also is the author of the American Girl series, The Care and Keeping of You, which is split into younger girls and older girls. So we're going to do a package of those three. And we want everyone to enter, whether you only have a daughter or only have a son, because one of the things that I think is really important is that girls should know how boy puberty works and boys mm. should know how girl puberty works. So don't just enter thinking, I only want the boy or the girl books. Like, take them all, regardless of the uh, the sex and gender of your child. That's great. I love it. And so to enter, just follow us on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter and like our book giveaway, tag a friend and leave a comment and you're entered to win. And you can enter as many times as you want. We're sticking to folks in the US right now, but even if you're abroad, we'd love to hear from you. And to wrap it up today, Lisa, what's your parenting to go? So one of the rules I live by in my own parenting is that no one in the world will think my kids are as cute and charming as I do. <laughs> and part of my job is to get them ready for the world. Yeah. And so when we have to lay down the law <laughs> as parents, that should be what's behind our motivation, which is to recognize that our kids need to navigate the world and they need to be polite and decent and have good hygiene because the world will not extend to them the same <laughs> margins of um, affection and love, regardless of how they act, that we will. And so if any parent is hesitating to lay down the law with their kid, one way to think is, How's this going to fly outside of my home? And if you know it will not fly outside of your home, do your kid the favor of getting the rules clear at home. It's great advice, getting it right at home, home training, best training. Exactly. See you next week, Rena. Thanks so much, Lisa. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Ask Lisa podcast so you get the episodes just as soon as they drop. And send us your questions to asklisa at drlisademore.com. And now a word from our lawyers. The advice provided on this podcast does not constitute or serve as a substitute for professional psychological treatment, therapy, or other types of professional advice or intervention. If you have concerns about your child's well-being, consult a physician or mental health professional. If you're looking for additional resources, check out Lisa's website at drlisademore.com. We'll see you next week.